Uh, welcome back. Um, we are still looking at the damped oscillator. In the last uh, class, the last module, uh, we derived this equation corresponding to the damped oscillator. So, just to uh, recall once again, um, the terms here are the one corresponding to dissipation, gamma here is the dissipation coefficient that is here and this S multiplied by X that is the term corresponding to restoring force and S is the uh, stiffness constant and we need this restoring force because without that you are not going to get oscillation in the first place and uh, we motivated ourselves by saying that uh, to get more realistic we need to add dissipation to the system and that corresponds to the second term. So, our model of dissipation here is that um, the dissipation coefficient multiplied to velocity would be the dissipative uh, force. Another way of saying that is is that the dissipative force is proportional to uh, velocity. From all these considerations, we have obtained this equation which is uh, right in front of you here. And now, in this module, we will <coughs> try and obtain uh, solutions for this equation. In fact, in the last module, we had already obtained a uh, solution for this equation and I have written it down here and you will notice that um, there are these two constants C1 and C2 just as it happened in the case of the undamped oscillator, the standard oscillator both these constants would be determined from the initial conditions and we will worry about it when we do a particular problem and then there is a first term which essentially corresponds to uh, dissipation simply because the dissipation coefficient gamma is right there in this term and uh, this is the term which we are going to now analyze this and this. So, what happens to this term would depend on uh, what happens to this quantity inside the square root. So, to do any further analysis, let us simplify this uh, equation a little bit, simplify in the sense of notational simplification. So, I am going to call this quantity gamma by 2 m as p and this quantity here under the uh, square root, in fact the entire quantity along with the square root I would like to call it as q. So, it is just a change of notation and when I do this and substitute it back in the equation, uh, this is the equation that I get. Uh, so, in fact, I can uh, slightly simplify it a little more by saying that x of t is equal to um, e power minus p into t c 1 e power q t plus c 2 e power minus q t. So, we are going to work with this equation and in particular we are going to be worried about uh, this quantity q. Uh, since it is under the square root, uh, we would like to know what are the various possible dynamical behavior that the uh, our damped oscillator can display for various possibilities of q. Uh, let us begin with the case 1 which implies that this gamma square by 4 m square minus S m is greater than 0 or uh, you could say that it is dominated by dissipation simply because uh, gamma square term is uh, greater than the uh, stiffness uh, coefficient. In this case, um, I can write the solutions, I can copy the solutions back again. So, x of t would correspond to e power minus p into t, um, then I have c e power q t plus c 2 e power minus q t. 
So, in principle this should be the solution that we want, uh, but we want to get it in a form that is uh, that's a little more clearer for us to understand what is going on. Um, ideally, I would like if my solution looks something like this, some A sin omega maybe omega tilde t plus phi because this is very clear as to what is happening. So, let us try and write this solution something that would look like this. So, that is the next few steps of our work. To do that we have these uh, two uh, constants C1 and C2. To make it easier I am going to replace those two constants C1 and C2 by two other constants D1 and D2. So, I have that freedom to do that. The way I, I would do that is to define new constants D1 as C1 plus C2 and D2 is C1 minus C2. So, with these redefinitions, so I am basically going to replace two constants C1 and C2 by two new constants D1 and D2. And now let me write C1 and C2 in terms of D1 and D2. So, it is a question of two constants, uh, basically two unknowns which I need to determine. So, I can write C1 as D1 plus D2 divided by 2 and C2 would be D1 minus D2 divided by 2. So, the next step is substitute these two quantities here, this and this here. So, substitute this in C2 and substitute this in C1. And if I do that, I am going to get my equation that might look like this. So, the next step is simply collect D1 terms and D2 terms separately and then we will see how now uh, in the new form it will uh, get to become much simpler. Let us now separate uh, the D1 and D2 terms in which case uh, x of t would become like this. Now, the next step is to recognize that this function that I have written down here is nothing but a sin hyperbolic function or actually in this case it is the cos hyperbolic function. And similarly, this function that I have written down here is sin hyperbolic function. So, it is sin h of q of t. So, you plug in these things back in the equation I get. So, this might look like it is uh, sort of good enough uh, for us, but uh, uh, let us go one step further and make it a little more uh, simpler, but to be able to do that I will have to uh, assume some initial condition. So, let me assume that at t equal to 0 x is equal to 0. So, if I plug in this initial condition in this equation, um, it will give me the following cos h of q t will give me 1, whereas uh, sin h of q t would be 0 at t equal to 0. So, in which case this simply tells me that d 1 equal to 0. So, by assuming one initial condition, what we have achieved is to set one of the constants to 0. So, that is the outcome. So, we will still be left with another constant to be able to determine that we still need one more initial condition, but for what we are doing uh, we can still uh, go ahead and uh, write the solution without having to determine uh, the second constant. With d 1 being equal to 0 let me write the solution. So, in this form our solution looks sufficiently simple enough that we can actually sketch the solution and see the behavior. So, it is a combination or actually the product of two possible functions. One is this exponential function 
as a function of time, this quantity is going to decay exponentially. Let us remind ourselves that P is dependent on gamma and m, but both are positive. So, P is a quantity that is greater than 0. So, this guarantees us that this function is exponentially decaying function. And similarly, this function sin hyperbolic function is a monotonically increasing function and we also know that in fact one of our conditions was that q is greater than 0. Now what we have is a product of these two functions, one which is exponentially decaying, other one which is increasing quite fast. And when I try to sketch the product of these two functions, I will get the displacement for a damped uh, system and that could look something uh, like this. Let us say that this is a curve that corresponds to value gamma 1, where gamma 1 is one of the possible values for the dissipation coefficient. And let me also for uh, clarity uh, plot uh, one more curve, something like this and let us say that this corresponds to gamma 2 and this gamma 1 and gamma 2, both of them are two different possible values of dissipation coefficients. They are such that gamma 1 is greater than gamma 2 okay. and physically what does it say? It tells me that if I keep increasing the dissipation coefficient or if I put an oscillator in a, in a viscous medium and the viscosity is actually larger and getting larger and larger in which case the maximum displacement that you will get. So, the maximum displacement corresponds to this value here. The maximum displacement would keep decreasing which makes sense simply because if the medium is more and more viscous you would not expect uh, the oscillator to, uh, to be displaced by a huge amount. So, in that sense physically it does uh, tally with our intuition of what is expected to happen when, when an oscillator is in a dissipative uh, medium. Finally, uh, we should also worry about what the solution itself is telling us that is gamma square by 4 m square was greater than s by m. Again to remind ourselves, so the dissipation dominates over the stiffness coefficient. So, in such a case the solution that we have written down and the one that we have sketched uh, basically tells us that there cannot be oscillations. So, if you remember the basic uh, uh, equation of motion for a standard oscillator gives you either a sine or a cosine function or a combination of these sine and cosine functions. In either of these cases, what you physically see is, a, is an oscillating solution. Here in the presence of dissipation, at least in one possible case where this condition is satisfied, you can have a situation where no oscillation is possible. So, for instance, physically if you try and uh, let us say have a, an oscillator set up in a highly viscous medium and you give it a push, the only thing that would happen is that the system would simply come back to the equilibrium position, which is what this graph is telling us. With this now let us go to the uh, second case. Let us uh, start again uh, from the original solution that we uh, wrote down here. So, I have it uh, in front of me here. So, I am going to put q equal to 0. So, if I do that this equation simplifies quite a bit. So, x of t would simply become c 1 into e power minus p t plus c 2 into e power minus p t which would uh, simply correspond to saying that it is c 1 plus c 2 into e power minus p t and uh, c 1 is a constant and c 2 is also a constant. So, sum of two constants is 
another constant. So, I do not need to maintain two different names for a single constant. So, I will just call it c into e power minus p t. The earlier cases that we worked out, we always had two solutions and c 1 and c 2 were constants corresponding to each one of these solutions. So, for instance, the general solution for the damped oscillator had this two parts. So, there is this first part which if you would like you could have called it as x 1 of t and there is the second part which you could have called it as x 2 of t. So, these are two linearly independent solutions. So, if you remember from the first module on oscillator, we kept uh, saying that um, since the equation of motion is a second order ordinary differential equation, you should have two linearly independent solutions. And for the damped oscillator, it is still a second order ordinary differential equation. So, this is a second order differential equation. So, this has two linearly independent terms such that you could say that the general solution is simply sum of these two linearly independent solutions. And we found that when you analyzed the case of let us say the case of uh, q uh, greater than 0 corresponding to this uh, first case. So, here again we had two different linearly independent combinations as solutions and it is our choice of putting a particular initial condition here which reduced it to one particular um, solution which is this. Now, here if you look at what we have done, we seem to have only one solution whereas again we are still looking at solutions of a second order differential equation. So, ideally there should have been a second solution as well. So, let me first start by calling this as x 1. So, there are uh, from the theory of differential equations, uh, there are ways of getting uh, the second solution given one solution. Here I already know one solution which is right in front of you here c into e power minus p t and using this I can get the second solution. So, that is a mathematical way of uh, doing it and uh, if you go back to any uh, basic books on differential equations, you can uh, in fact, they, the book will tell you how to do that. So, I am not going to do that uh, here. On the other hand, we can once again guess a second solution. So, there has to be some basis for guessing a second solution. The basis is that uh, we already know that uh, the two solutions that we get should be linearly independent. So, which means that I have one solution here and now my aim is to write the second solution and the condition on the second solution is that it should be linearly independent from the first. In other words, x 2 of t should not be some constant times x 1 of t. So, I cannot just multiply it by x multiply x 1 by another constant. So, what is the simplest thing I can do such that x 2 will be linearly independent of x 1. The simplest thing I can do is to simply multiply by t. So, simply multiply x 1 of t by t. So, if I do that, this is what I get, but in general I can put in a different uh, constant here and let me call it d. Now, I can write down the general solutions x of t is x 1 of t plus x 2 of t which will be c e power minus p t plus d t into e power minus p t uh, which will be c plus d t into e power minus p t. So, I have my solution and in fact, you could go back and verify that uh, the second solution which we basically simply guessed by saying that we will make the simplest of change or multiply a simplest 
simple function to x1 of t and manufacture a second solution which is what I have done. But you could always substitute this back in the equation and verify that this indeed is a possible solution. I urge you to do that uh, yourself, I will not uh, spend time on that here. Mm. So my complete uh, solution is and now I have two unknowns which is C and D, both of which are um, constants which have to be determined from initial conditions. And again it tallies with what we have been saying right from first that if you are dealing with solutions of second order ordinary differential equations, there is bound to be two constants which need to be determined from uh, initial conditions. Now uh, to understand what is happening, let us again sketch this solution and this is a much simpler uh, uh, solution to sketch because the T dependence comes from these two terms, this and this. One of them is exponentially decaying very fast and this other one which is dt is only linearly increasing. So clearly it is somewhat easier to handle. So the displacement as a function of time could look something like this. And you can also determine the time at which the displacement is maximum which is this and let us call it T max and I urge you to verify that T max is equal to uh, 2 m divided by gamma and using the value of T max you can also find out what is the value of largest displacement which would correspond to this value here and if you call it X max you can find that value as well and again I leave it as an exercise for you to determine the value of uh, X max. So all this you can do from the condition that at this point dx by dt is equal to 0. So again this is the second case which is often called the case of uh, Q equal to 0 but it goes by the name of what is called critical damping. So in this case again there is no oscillation. So we already saw one case of uh, the first case which was Q greater than 0, there was no oscillations in that case and again in this uh, particular case of Q equal to 0, the system is completely damped. So you give it a push to a system or an oscillator that is uh, inside a viscous medium. Uh, the oscillator is simply going to come back to the equilibrium position without showing any oscillations. Uh, now let us look at the case of Q less than 0. So I, we have the general solution in front of us, this one. And now when Q is less than 0, the quantity in, inside the square root becomes negative. So which means that this is the case since Q is less than 0. So this is the case of um, S by M being greater than gamma square by 4 M square. So in this case the storing force or the stiffness coefficient dominates over the dissipation coefficient. So you can imagine this to be a case of uh, weaker uh, dissipation. So the uh, I can rewrite this uh, quantity in the under the square root differently. So let me start by doing that. I have this gamma square by 4 m square minus s by m. Since uh, s by m is greater than uh, gamma square by 4 m square, this would correspond to square root of minus 1 multiplied by S by M minus gamma square by 4 M square whole to the power half. And root of minus 1 is of course our I into S by M minus gamma square by 4 M square whole to the power half. 
Now I will plug this in back in our uh, general uh, equation in which case um, I would get something like this x of t is equal to e power minus p t into uh, c 1 e power i. Now, when I uh, assembled the uh, solution here, this last equation, this pretty much looks like uh, sum of two uh, exponential solution and of course, there is an i. So, this does and is going to provide us oscillatory solutions in which case I can do the following. I can call this as I can call this by a different name. Let me call this as omega 1 both these quantities. This will of course, allow us to simplify it a bit. So, if I do that I will be able to rewrite the equation in a slightly simpler form uh, from which we can easily understand what is going on. Once I plug in this change of notation basically omega 1 this is what I am going to get and to be sort of consistent let me also say that omega 0 would be s by m or omega 0 square would be s by m and omega 1 square would be s by m minus gamma square by 4 m square. So, this clearly uh, tells us that omega 0 which is the angular frequency of the undamped oscillator is greater than omega 1 which is the angular frequency of the damped oscillator. Uh, now, to simplify it further I have these two constants C 1 and uh, C 2 and this is a technique that we used earlier as well uh, because we have freedom in choosing these two constants. I can uh, take these two constants C 1 and C 2 and introduce two other constants. So, let me call C 1 to be C by 2 i into e power uh, i phi and let me call C 2 to be minus C over 2 i e power minus i phi. Now, if I plug in these two choices that I have made for C 1 and C 2 back in the equation, I am going to get the following with the little uh, rearrangement it would uh, look like this. This can be further simplified C into e power minus p t uh, e power i. Now, when you look at this equation it is very clear that uh, the term inside the square brackets is simply the sin function. So, this can be written as sin omega 1 t plus phi so, just comes from the basic trigonometry. So, now I can uh, easily write the solution for displacement as uh, C e power minus p t into sin omega 1 t plus phi. So, that is remarkable in the sense that for the case when uh, q is less than 0 where the stiffness coefficient dominates over the dissipation coefficient what we get is one term which is the sign term for instance is the oscillatory function whereas, this e power minus p t is a exponentially decaying function. So, now if you look at uh, the solution that I have it has two constants one is phi and other is of course, the constant c. Uh, so, initially we had two constants c 1 and uh, c 2 here this and this and they were now replaced by these two other constants which is c and uh, phi. Uh, oscillatory function like sin omega 1 t plus phi is being modulated by 
the exponentially decaying function which is e power minus p t. So, you should expect to get something like this sin function whose peaks something like this. So, the, the, the decaying profile here is e power minus p t. Uh, this distance in time from here to here will define for us one full time period until this point and that would correspond to let us call this uh, time period uh, T 1. So, this would correspond to 2 pi by omega 1 and of course, this would then be 2 times that time period 2 T 1 and this would correspond to 3 T 1 and so on. So, when you look at the final solution you see something that seems to appeal to uh, intuition. You have an oscillatory solution which is modulated by an exponentially decaying uh, profile. So, clearly uh, the role of dissipation which is actually embedded here inside this exponentially decaying function because p is gamma by 2 m gamma is your dissipation coefficient leads to displacements which are decreasing as a function of time. In fact, when you do any uh, experiment for instance you take a simple pendulum and let it oscillate this is exactly what you see in the presence of air as a dissipative medium successively the um, maximum displacement of the pendulum essentially keeps decreasing and finally it uh, stops and this also tells us uh, another point here that if gamma is equal to 0 which means that I do not have dissipation in the medium at all. So, any energy that I put in in the system will remain there forever if that is the case then p would be equal to 0 and then the solution would simply be equal to and if you remember that uh, gamma is 0 would imply that omega 1 is equal to omega 0 this would simply reduce to c sin omega 0 t plus phi and this you would recognize is simply the solution for the standard harmonic oscillator without any dissipation. So, what we see is that in the presence of dissipation you do get oscillation at least in one of the possible cases whose amplitudes are successively decreasing and if you take the limit of no dissipation corresponding to gamma equal to 0, you recover the solution corresponding to standard uh, oscillator. So, I will stop uh, this module with this and in the subsequent modules we will look at also including uh, effects such as uh, forcing an oscillator. In other words, you keep supplying energy to the oscillator. So, that will come later.